This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Dennis Gartman. Dennis is the editor and publisher of The Gartman Letter. Dennis appears everywhere. CNBC, Bloomberg, you name it, he's there. Discussing commodities, capital markets, he's everywhere. The Gartman Letter, very well known. Dennis, highly opinionated, very, very, very strong opinions. However, I do like the fact that he thinks in trends. He thinks about cutting his losses. I'm always, always eager to have people on my show that have those views. I hope you enjoy. Dennis Gartman. Hey, Dennis. Mike Covell. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you? Not too bad. You're expecting me now, I assume? Yep. Absolutely. Let me ask you a quick question. What's the connection to Suffolk? What's the connection to Suffolk? I live here. Ah, okay. That my mother grew up there. Last name Pruden. Oh, really? Yeah. In Suffolk, Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Used to be. Did she uh, really? Yeah. So I, I saw that, and I was like, I figured you must live there because you know, people that know Suffolk usually it's like, oh, I, okay, you must must be some connection there. Yeah. No, I'm I I live here. My office is here. I've lived here for the last twenty five years. Ah, okay. My grandmother used to live over in Riverview. I I, I miss going over there and visiting. Uh, we we live in the northern part of the city, up near the James River Bridge, right on the uh, right on the confluence of the uh, Nansen River and the uh, James River. Ah, okay, great, great. Well, very cool. I, the young man who works for me, Chip, lives in Riverview. Ah, great, awesome, cool part of the world. I've always, I mean, I've been going down there since I was a kid. So, yeah. um, hey, let me jump right in. Your, okay. How did you get started? Your first trade, your mentor, what brought you into this world? Uh, my first job out of graduate school was as the economist for Cotton Incorporated. My job was uh, to um, understand how the cotton futures market functioned, how, how hedgers used the cotton futures market, how the commercials used it, how farmers used it. Uh, from there, I ended up trading. Uh, I, I was fascinated by the markets all the time, and uh, traded foreign exchange for what was then NCNB, uh, now Bank of America in in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Uh, traded uh, financial instrument futures for them for a while, and then uh, became enamored enough of them that them bought a seat on the board of trade in Chicago and moved there in uh, the oh, I think uh, the late 1970s, and stayed there till the middle 1980s and. At that time, I was now 35 years old and too old to be on the floor of the Board of Trade, trading bond futures. So moved to uh, Southern Virginia and uh, had been producing uh, the the Gartman Letter ever since. Uh, who was my mentor? Uh, that's hard to say. Uh, uh, Gary Schilling has has been a, a a big impact upon me. Paul Tudor Jones, who actually was at my desk for a while, and when he was trading cotton for. Uh, uh, Eli Tullis down in New Orleans, uh, spent some time in Raleigh, so we became friends. I wouldn't say Paul was a mentor, I'd say he's more of a friend. Um, hard to say who the mentors were. Pete Stottlemyre on the Board of Trade, uh, was a, uh, was a, uh, an important teacher, and a number of the guys on the Board of Trade who were just excellent floor traders were, were important people to me. But, uh, I'm, I'm not sure there was any one individual who was a mentor, and I'm not sure there was one certain date that said this is what you want to do was sort of uh, serendipitous along the way you know you mentioned uh chicago trading late 70s to the mid 80s that was a a fairly eventful time many people that i've written about were were there at that time that that must have been quite an experience i mean you were exposed to quite a few successful people during that time it was the it was the period of time when the bond market was in its last throes of the 30-year bear market um and it, it was amazing how many people had a hard time making the change from what had been a an egregious bear market in bonds to what turned to be the next 30-year bull market in bonds. Uh, how many floor traders misunderstood that the market had changed 
it was also a period of time when tax spreads uh, were were no longer available, and I, I'm afraid that a lot of floor traders who thought they were really very good were actually nothing more than taking the other side of huge tax spreads, and the tax spreaders who were doing the tax spreads didn't really care about giving one or two thirty seconds away on the bond futures, and a lot of floor traders thought they were good traders, and actually they were just the the makers of liquidity in these enormous numbers of spreads. And when the tax spreads were taken away, it, it was very, very difficult for those guys to, uh, to, uh, continue on. Plus, the, the advent of, of, of the change from the floor to off the floor trading was extraordinary. The, the, in the past year or the past five years, the movement from open outcry to, uh, computer has, has obviously revolutionized the business. If you had asked me 15 years ago if open outcry would have ever died, I would have said absolutely not. And clearly, I would have been absolutely wrong. Uh, open outcry is is on its way out, except for the the uh, execution of uh, options, complex options orders. But uh, the the advent of the computer has made trading so much more. I don't want to say this de- democratic and so much fairer. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Every time I see the uh, the live shots from someone in from one of the Chicago exchanges, and they still try to, for TV purposes, make it look like there's action going on there, but it's a morgue. Yeah, there's really not. It's really quite sad. Uh, I was on the board of uh, the Kansas City Board of Trades uh, Board of Directors for a number of years, and it was actually my job as the outside board of director to explain to the floor traders that, guys, the game has changed, and you might as well get used to the fact that the, that the, that the screen is going to replace you, and you're going out of business. Yeah. Hey, here's where I want to jump in main today. At the, at the end of our conversation, we could talk about some current stuff, but I thought since I had you on today, there would be some great big picture wisdom. And some of my notes that I put together were pulled from, I don't, I've seen either various numbers, 19, 21, 22 points that were, that you have really abided by. And I thought these would be great to let you elaborate a little on because even though perhaps to me, to you, many in the audience, they might sound like common sense. They're not so commonly applied. And I just want to start with the very first one, which is it's just, it's simple sounding, but never, ever add to a losing position ever. And boy, people love to violate that. Yeah, we all do. I mean, we're human beings and uh, we're going to, hell, I even do it myself I'm, uh, uh, every once in a while. And every time you do, uh, you will usually live to regret it. And when you don't regret it, it's only a matter of time until you do regret it. And very simply put, if you if you buy something at 12 and it goes to 15, the market's telling you you're right, and there's only one thing that can be happening to the to the size of your account, and that is it's getting larger. If you buy something at 12 and it goes to 10, uh, there's only one thing that can be happening to the size of your uh, equity in your account, and that is it's getting smaller, and you're wrong. Why would you do more of something that's wrong? Why would you do more? Why would you tell the market, which is the sum total of the wisdom? of everybody else involved, that they're wrong and you're right. Why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. So when you do that, it almost always is it, it, it almost always is a disaster. And that dovetails right into just the, the concept of buying strength. Buying strength, selling weakness. I mean, these are, they're not necessarily, that's not, you know, obviously not a fundamental type concept. It's very technically driven, but... That really is the way, and you mentioned growing up uh, in your formative years and on the floors in Chicago, it was all about strength and weakness, wasn't it? Well, I think that it is. I think it's it's not a matter of buying low and selling high. That's that's just not, nobody's capable of doing that. It's a matter of buying high and selling higher. Uh, it's a matter of being short, selling something that's already weak and going down uh, and buying it later. As uh, On the short side, I, as I used to say, you want to throw your rocks into the wettest paper sack because it breaks the easiest. And and I think that that makes sense to people when it's explained to them. So, um, yeah, it, I, I think on balance, tending being a momentum trader is probably better than not being. Buying high and selling higher is the, is the better way to go. And the great traders, the great successes, the people who have constantly won, the people who have survived are those who do exactly that. Psychologically, it's not necessarily easy. I mean, the idea of buying strength, it doesn't, because the natural inclination is people, I want to buy something on sale. I want something cheap. Yes, that, that is the, the normal way that people like to buy things. They do like to buy stuff that's on sale, but that, that I don't think has proven the proper course of action over the course of the many years. 
you know, you you can if you if it's easiest to speak about stocks. If if you watch some stock go from ten to to twenty, and it corrects back to fifteen or sixteen, well then maybe you want to buy that weakness because it's still up from ten, but. You, you don't want to buy any more at 14 if you bought some at 16 because the market's telling you you're wrong. You may not want to get out, but you certainly don't want to buy any more, and, and you can't buy any more. The rules are really are, are best observed if you say, gee, I bought it at 16 on a correction. It's gone to 14. I still think I'm right. But you can't buy any more until it gets back to 17 or 18 when the market's again telling you that you're right. And that That's hard to do, and as Pete Stottlemyre once said, do the hard trade. And that's that's always the better trade. Do the trade that's hard to do. The easy trade is usually the one that you don't want. The hard trade is usually the one that you do want. Dennis, talk about systems from your perspective. And I mean, I've seen you make the comment, and I, I agree, and I, I know many great traders will agree with it, which is the idea, keep your systems simple, robust, yeah. simple, straightforward. What do you mean by that for the audience out there? Well, I, I, I'm amused by the numbers of people who, who go off into all sorts of esoteric Technical, you know, five wave A, B, C corrections. The more you confuse yourself, the more difficult you're going to you're going to make it. Try to keep things pretty simple. Try to draw simple trend lines. Try to use simple moving averages. Try to try to look for things where the highs are higher and the lows are higher. That's a bull market. Try to buy it. Uh, try to sell the things where the Lows are lower and the highs are lower. That's a bear market. Try to sell that. Don't don't make it any more sophisticated than that. And really, quite honestly, the guy again, the people who have succeeded, the people who have survived, seem to me to be the ones who have kept it simple, who have not gone overboard into esoterica. Try to buy bull markets. Try to sell bear markets, and try to keep it as simple as that. You'll probably succeed more than those who will, who are looking for Fibonacci retracements and and uh, uh, ABC uh, corrections. I, I, I find that very confusing, and I find that most of us confuse ourselves. You seem to be making the case for like, hey, the price is what we should be looking at, and let's make decisions off that. And if somebody wants to develop a theory, uh, for example, Elliott Wave, Fibonacci retracements and all that stuff, perhaps that's fine, all and dandy. But at the end of the day, back to the very beginning points you're making here, if you're losing money, you're doing something wrong. If you're making money, you're, you're probably doing something right, and, and you got to keep it simple. I, I think so. I, I, as I tell people, I'm probably 75% a, a, a technical trader and, and probably 25% fundamentalist. I do want to understand why something is going up for a fundamental reason, uh, but then I want to go and look and see, is it in fact going up? I've been bullish of, of aluminum for a long period of time, since basically last October. It's been one of my really better ideas. Uh, and, and I just came to the simple conclusion that automobiles were going to be using more aluminum, that that uh, the economic circumstances in China seem always to be moving from the lower left to the upper right. Automobile sales there are going to be increasing. And under the Environmental Protection Agency's mandates to increase the miles per gallon on cars, the easiest way to do that is reduce the weight, and reducing weight is done the easily or best by replacing steel with aluminum. I, I didn't want to get into it any more sophisticated than that. Then aluminum stocks stopped going down. Then aluminum stocks started to go up. They they didn't make new lows. They started to take out previous highs. And at, at that point, I said the technicals are beginning to turn bullishly. The fundamentals, as I understand them, and there were plenty of people who were taking me to task for what I said, started to work. I, I think that's very illustrative of how to do this business. Uh, have some idea as to why something is going up or why something is going down. Understand it to the best of your knowledge, and then check and see if 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 you're bullish. Is whatever you're bullish of going up? Is whatever you're bearish of going down? If they are, do the trade. You know, on the flip side of that, though, if you had that fundamental perspective on aluminum and, and, and cars and whatnot, manufacturing, and the market goes against you. You're going to get out. You're going to get out. You don't have any choice. doesn't mean you can't get back in later. And, and, and therein probably is the toughest thing for anybody to do. Let's say you, you bought aluminum Alcoa at, at 8.5 and, and you got stopped out at, at 8. And you bought it again at 8.5 and, and you got stopped out again at 8. And you bought it again at eight and a half and you got stopped out at eight. The hardest thing to do is to say, Oh look, Alcoa's trading nine. It's now gone above every previous high. 
volume starting to come in. I've got to buy it now because it's an even better trade. That's the hardest thing in the business to do. And that's the right thing because at that point, everybody else who's tried to sell it probably has sold it. They're now short, and suddenly you see volume coming in on the upside. That's that's the hardest thing is to get stopped out several times on an idea. Keep making sure that you keep your your losses to a you know a, a dull roar, and then when it finally starts to do what you think it should be doing, come back with uh, bullets blazing. Buy some if it works. Buy some more if it works. Goes more. Buy some more. That's the hardest thing to do. You know, this point that I'm going to mention that you've said, which is something that I agree with as well, be patient with winning trades, be enormously impatient with losers. Now, we've touched on that partly, but the being patient with winning trades, not just dying to take that profit, but letting that move fully go, that's really where you're headed there, aren't you? No, absolutely. I, I think one of the worst aphorisms in the business is you never go broke taking a profit. Mm -hmm. now, that's just silly. The, the the average investor takes a, a, a 2% profit, a 2% profit, a 3% profit, a 2% profit, then takes a 40% loss. Therein lies the problem. The, the, the game is, is to, to buy Alcoa at, at 9 and watch it trade 16 and keep buying it because it's probably going to go to 40. That's, that's the real, that makes up for a lot of mistakes. That makes up for a lot of errors. That makes up for a lot of misjudgments. And that's hard to do. Yeah. I mean, the big money's made on the big moves. Hey, let me ask, your, your daily grind, your daily digging through, what is your process? What, what do you like to read? What, do you, what kind of information do you like to take in? How do you approach your daily world? I, I read a lot. I, I read ridiculous numbers of newspapers. Uh, I, really, I, I read the other things that other people are writing. I, the... It, it was interesting, 25 years ago, 26 years ago when I started doing this, uh, all you had was a was maybe the Dow Jones Newswire, maybe Reuters, none of which were really very good. And at that time, all you had were newspapers. And, and so I, I can remember when I moved to Suffolk uh, 26 years ago, and I was getting the China People's Daily and, and the Moscow Times uh, and the South China Morning Post and the Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, and the postmaster was quite dismayed and even somewhat disturbed when he saw the China Daily being sent in. <laughs> but back then it was interesting because I could read the China Daily and what I read, even though it was three or four days late, I was still days in advance of what anybody else was seeing. And so my job then was to read, as I used to say, the information begins on page 32 of some obscure newspaper and eventually makes its way to page one. And, and the trick was to know what was on page 32 that was important. That was always the hard part. And, and, and so that's what I used to do. And, and I still do. I still read uh, newspapers copiously. And I don't read them online. I read them physically because there is so much is missed on the online subscriptions. Uh, they don't give you page 32. Uh, they don't give you page 64. They don't give you the little blurb. They give you headlines. And there's still something to be said by, by, by reading the Financial Times, and, and I will simply say at this point, uh, in the old days, the FT was so much better than the, than the, uh, than the uh, Wall Street Journal, and I have to give the Wall Street Journal enormous credit. Under, under Rupert Murdoch, the journal has gone from being simply a, a place where earnings were reported to actually being a first-class global newspaper. It's really quite good. So I read the FT every day, the Financial Times of London, which is still the best newspaper in the world. But I make sure that I read the, the, the journal head front to back. I flip every page. I, I make sure I read the Investor's Business Daily. I, I, I make sure that I read the China Daily. I, I, I try my best to read the newspapers out of Moscow, uh, which are all in English, by the way. You know, my, and, and, and I listen to what other people are saying, pick up bits and pieces from, uh, from uh, my Reuters screen that I have at hand. But the, the vast majority of the day is spent reading and, and, trying to find little blurbs, little pieces of information that, that may become terribly important over the not too distant, over the not too distant future. That's what I do. And, and, you know, I, I pay attention to port movements. What's moving in and out of the ports at, here in Norfolk or, or in, or in Los Angeles or in New York? Uh, or is, is port traffic up or is port traffic down? Uh, I spend a lot of time looking to see what the tax revenue is doing because, uh, Tax revenues, I think, are the best indicator, current indicator of how economic activity is 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 moving. I, as I like to say, 
I, I, I'm not that smart. I have not been around, you know, I've only been around 62, 63 years now, but I, I've learned a few things. And one of the things I have learned is that I've never met anybody who's paid taxes on business they think they're going to do or hours they think they're going to work. People only pay taxes on hours that they've worked and business they've done, profits that they've earned. And if tax revenues are going up, gee, I don't care what anybody else tells me about economic activity. Economic activity is doing better. So I pay attention to that sort of thing. I, and I look for obscure things. I, I, I once got um, uh, interested in what was happening in Japan because pet sales were picking up rather dramatically. It's little bits and pieces like that that are, that are important. Yeah. I've spent most of my time in the last year and a half in Asia, and I, while I'm really not coming at it from a fundamental perspective, it's hard not to just be an observer of data because it's so terribly interesting to just take in all the data points that are coming every which way. And it's my first time uh, spending a lot of time in Asia, and it's just uh, it's, it's terribly fascinating. Yeah. So let me jump to the idea of mass psychology. So we've seen in the last uh, 15 years, we've seen the Nobel Prizes being handed out, uh, you know, whether it's Schiller, Vernon Smith, Daniel Kahneman. And I think they really have helped. Uh, and I, I'm assuming the idea of an efficient market hypothesis is not something you necessarily. Uh, I do not agree with the efficient market <laughs> hypothesis. Even uh, yeah, I was assuming. But, you know, we've seen these uh, Nobel Prizes handed out to these smart guys that uh, have have really put down uh, some great thoughts on mass psychology. But, you know, I always argue that I think a lot of the traders on the floors in Chicago in the early 80s had actually figured out the whole mass psychology thing from a trading perspective and were being rewarded for it. They just didn't get Nobel Prizes for it. Well, I, I, I will, I've will. i been on in speech after speech and in, in report after report that I've written. I, I will say that the most important thing that's happened in the study of economics in the past 20 years is is the putting on a pedestal, and, and one that I think is long overdue, the notion that psychology has something to do with economics. Mm. Um, I, I, I do find it almost comical, this belief in the efficient market, because I, I find it refuted in just too many different men. There's too many people who are just good at this. And the efficient market theory says nobody will be good at this except by, by mere accident. I, I'm, I'm pleased to find out that we finally do have the the Tverskys and the Kahnemans at all who are, are, are being rewarded for actually knocking on the door of the efficient market people with a big broad axe and saying, you're wrong, that psychology does in fact uh, have a, a, an impact in what goes on, that people are human, we are irrational far more often than we're rational. As I like to say, we are irrational beings dealing with rational information, and sometimes we're rational beings dealing with irrational information. <laughs> Out of that, how can you get substantive rationality and that's what the efficient market theory seems to 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 believe in so uh yeah I, i'm 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 not a believer in efficient markets i'm a believer in behavioral economics and i think that's a great great thing that's happened yeah i've had quite a few behavioral economists on my on my show and i've really enjoyed the conversations and it's just so much more pragmatic and down to earth and and frankly scientific and and like okay here's the evidence let's Take a look at this. Let's. What does this mean? Let's observe it. Not just a dogmatic theory that says this is the way the world is. And if contrary evidence is put out, oh, well, we're just going to keep saying what, what we've said all along. It's. Do you think the battle's been won, though? Do you think? Do you think uh, the efficient market hypothesis has taken the the stake to the heart, so to speak? Yeah, I do. I, I actually do. I think it takes a long time. The the change in academia is is very very slow. It take it's 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 glacial in 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 changing. And I think that it is indeed changing. Uh, I, I think the there, there will come a time 50 years from now when when behavioral economics will no will, will will by some chance be rendered defunct. But for right now, behavioral economics I think is 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 the young upstart and the bright the bright upstart and the efficient market theory is the old guard, the regime ancien, and it's losing its validity. Hey Dennis, let's spend a few minutes just talking about current today. Uh, Take your thoughts on a wide assortment of issues. Pretty hectic, chaotic times right now. We've got a stock market that looks lovely. It's straight up. Nobody can argue with a, a straight line up. That's uh, fantastic until it decides to bend at some point in time. But geopolitically, uh, things are getting a little rough around the edges, aren't they? Well, first of all, things are always rough around the edges. It's just that we know the rough edges better than we used to know the rough edges. 20 years ago, you would not have known about 
a rebellion in eastern Ukraine. Believe me, you wouldn't have known it. Uh, it would have been covered on page 32 of some obscure newspapers, and only a few people would have discussed it. Now, because of the advent of the Internet, because of the advent of better communications, not only do you know it, it's front and center. The world is actually, interestingly enough, that I'm not a, I'm not a fan of our president, but our president actually made a statement last week that was really quite truthful and correct. The world is safer now than it ever has been. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, it's just that what, what problems exist are now so much more readily available to us. We understand them faster. We hear them faster. They are debated more. There's 24-7 news is a, is a wonderful thing, but it's also rather disconcerting because it jangles the nerves. But to be quite honest, this is actually the safest of all times, not the, not the unsafest, <laughs> but because we have to deal with it, because it's 24-7 news, sure seems like it's, a, it's an unsafe place. And because of that, markets become uh, uh, rather uh, schizophrenic. I mean, the, the manner in which everything reversed last Thursday on the Malaysian air flight uh, disaster, how, why, why should, the, the, why should the, the Australian dollar suddenly sell off relative to the Japanese yen predicated upon a disaster in Ukraine? Uh, I don't know. Uh, didn't make any sense to me, but it did uh, because panic ensued, and and it's and it's part of the fact that it's a 24/7 news cycle where news is absolutely on the front pages. 25 years ago, if a plane had been shot down in eastern Ukraine, we wouldn't have known about it for two or three days. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely uh, disconcerting, as you say. I think we have all become a little too accustomed. It's almost like we we kind of enjoy the fear, perhaps. I, I, I sometimes say that uh, 9-11 and the dot-com crash instilled a type of fear in America that just I just wish would go away. I, I don't think yes. it's, it's, it's not useful. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. It's not healthy, but it is the reality. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dennis, listen, I appreciate you taking the time today. Where can we direct people to you? The easiest uh, thing to do is just to go to our website, uh, thegartmanletter.com. And uh, happy to let people take a look at uh, at the work that's done. I, I, I get up every morning about 1 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time and try to have nine, eight or nine pages of what I hope is, is reasonably cogent, sometimes comical, and, and I hope insightful views of what's going on in the world. As I, as I like to tell people, my job is to be the liberal arts major of the capital markets. I know a, <laughs> a fair amount about the grain market. I know a fair amount about foreign exchange. I know a fair amount about equities. A fair amount about uh, uh, oil, um, a fair amount about the Fed and, and, and debt, and, and a fair amount about political circumstances. Uh, I, I don't know everything about everything, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly well versed in a lot of stuff. And my job is to explain to the grain trader what's happening in the foreign exchange market that may affect the grain business. My job is to explain to the, the foreign exchange dealer what's happening over in the oil market that it may have an impact upon foreign exchange or to explain to the grain trader what's going on over in the oil market. Uh, I can't tell the oil trader more about oil than he or she knows, and if I can, haven't helped that person. But I, I, I tend to bring a, a broad overview as to what's going on, a view from, far from the matting crowd here in Suffolk, Virginia, away from the noise of New York, away from the noise of Chicago, away from the noise of London, and say, you know what, I think this is what's really going on. So they can go to uh, thegartmanletter.com, take a look at what, what it is that's produced, and, and I'll be blunt, it's not cheap. Uh, but because it comes out every day, I, we've had subscribers with us now for 25 years, and uh, uh, they seem to, to enjoy it. As, some, as a friend of mine once said, the Gartman letter is read in all the great men's restrooms around the world early in the morning. <laughs> hey, two, two quick questions I want to address that things you just said. 1 a.m., when did you go to bed? About 10. I, I learned years and years ago in undergraduate school, um, I, I had to work to go to school. I was also a diver, so I had to hit the springboard, and something had to get, something had to give, and uh, give was sleep. And, and I've learned to get along with three and four hours sleep ever since then. I learned that, uh, that uh, Winston Churchill got by on three hours sleep, and he seemed to do pretty well in life. So if he could do it, uh, so too could I. Um, it, it helps to pick up four or five hours upon everybody else's. 
as my daughters used to say, well, Dad has no choice. He's got an IQ of 70. He needs that extra three hours just to get back to the car. <laughs> hey, one last question. Are we ever going to see interest income again? Yes. I may be dead, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. We'll, we'll see the Fed funds rate back at 5% in the next five years or so. There's not a question about that. Uh, it'll, it, it, it will eventually come. A, a normalization of rates will occur. And the one thing you do know is when the Fed begins to tighten rates, they will, it, it will be the first of many tightenings, not the, not, not, not a one-off, but the first of many to come. And that may well, that, that will be indicative of growth in the economy, not, not indicative of, of inflation. Yeah. Hey, Dennis, thank you for taking the time today. And, uh, I, I hear you about the three hours of sleep though, but you're a better man than I. I, I don't know if I can function. I, I, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how you do it, but Hey, listen, thank you for taking the time today and best of luck. Honor to have been asked, but we'll do it again in the future. And as I like to sign off every day, good luck and good trading. Take care, Dennis. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.